Hello everyone and welcome to this video which is in our re-engineering the chess classic series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are taking a look at a bit of a heartbreaker. A game that David Janowski should have won from Akiba Rubinstein at the St. Petersburg International Preliminary 1914 but ended up losing. Um, very interesting game. Uh, isolated Queen's pawn position and uh, yeah you know I mean looking at the the careers of uh, of David Yanovsky and also Efim Boglubov as well you uh, I think it's a, a, a sort of a salutary lesson to um, you know be wary of what you uh, of what you wish for really because uh, you know both players um, at some stage of their careers you know could have been considered the, the strongest player in the world um, with Efim Boglubov certainly in 1925 when he was winning the Moscow International you know, really playing super well. I mean, uh, yeah, people were definitely talking about him as a future world champion. Yeah, Janowski is less clear, but, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, the uh, the late 1890s, you know, a number of different players had claims to be um, to be the world's strongest player. Tarash certainly believed that he was stronger than, uh, than the current world champion, uh, Emmanuel Lasker. So, you know, um, uh, you know, at that period in their career, they were both enormously respected. But, um, you know, after... They lost their world championship matches. Uh, Janowski, of course, uh, well, lost two matches. One, only one of them a world championship match, but he lost two matches against Laska really, really badly. And uh, yeah, Bogolubov got, um, well, convincingly beaten by uh, by Alekin twice. Um, somehow, yeah, that, that seemed to, to cast a pall over the, the rest of their achievements and everything that they'd achieved until then um, somehow seemed to get forgotten. And the only thing that was remembered was that they'd lost those matches. And uh, I think for Janowski, it's, it's even worse somehow because um, uh, somehow the, the games that have made in, it into the, um, uh, the public consciousness, you know, as, as history passes, it's all the um, yeah, it's all the bad games. It's the games that uh, that he lost against a young Capablanca. You know that sort of showed how good Capablanca was getting. Um, uh, a game that uh, Yanovsky should have won. He lost against uh, a tiny uh, Samuel Rashevsky, giving Rashevsky his uh, uh, his first victory against a famous grandmaster. And of course, Yanovsky was completely winning in that game. And there's this game against Akiba Rubinstein that um, well, yeah, Yanovsky lost, and uh, it barely seems possible. You know, so, uh, yeah, history can be very, very cruel. You know, uh, the good things that you do just get forgotten and uh, somehow the bad things just uh, tend to define you later on. But anyway, you know, that's the nice thing about uh, what's happening in uh, in modern chess. You know, so many new books coming out about uh, about old players' history being, uh, being reassessed. And, uh, well, you know, some of the... Uh, uh, some of the uh, um, the players who didn't become world champion at least getting some recognition for the fantastic players they were. So let's have a look at this game. It was uh, very, very interesting. So um, uh, we've got d4, d5, knight f3, c5, c4, e6, and now e3, which um, I think uh, Tarash thought that this was the best reply to, uh, to, uh, to the Tarash. Um, well, time has not proven him correctly, but it's a perfectly reasonable way of playing. So knight f6 and now again bishop d3. We've seen this many times. It was just a mannerism of Yanovsky, just like Tarash, never really worrying about uh, trying to develop the bishop to c4 efficiently. Presumably, I mean, I guess, you know, Tarash always said that um, in the uh, Lopez, you know, when black played e takes d4, that was a poor move and that, you know, gave white the advantage. So I imagine that um, maybe that there was a similar reasoning that, uh, you know, d takes c4 was uh, was not the best move and, uh, you know, would actually give white an advantage. So wasting a tempo was uh, was not um, was not really a problem because you know d takes c4 in itself was not great. But on the other hand, Janowski you know played the queen's gambit accepted an awful lot. So uh, I'm a bit confused that he uh, he didn't really uh, ever really worry about this. But okay, that's what happened. D takes c4 and a6. And uh, actually, white's just a tempo down and a queen's gambit accepted now. Normally, the uh, the black knight would be on uh, on b8. So uh, the engines recommend d takes c5, which does indeed seem quite sim uh, sensible, really. You know, these um, uh, symmetrical positions with the queens off, well, with an extra tempo, they're slightly better for white. So, yeah, maybe even this one might be. But uh, Yanovsky went knight c3, b5, bishop d3, and just took on the isolated queen's pawn. He was never afraid of that at all. Um, knight b4 from, um, from uh, Rubinstein, just uh, sort of getting at that d5 square, ready to blockade. 
Bishop to b1 from uh, Janowski. And now, yeah, maybe a slightly surprising move. Knight bd5 from uh, from uh, Rubinstein. It might be more natural just to leave the knight on there and wait for it maybe to be chased away with uh, with a3 before you go knight bd5. But, uh, yeah, nothing wrong with, uh, with that move. So, um, yeah, Janowski played uh, queen e2. The engines are looking a lot at playing uh, a4, but um, it's sort of you know, leading to sort of liquidation on the queen side, really. The engines don't think that white has got, uh, you know, anything in this position. They're not fans, generally, of the, uh, of the IQPs. I have to say that, uh, you know, I spent my whole professional career playing IQPs, but um, by the end of my professional career, you know, having analysed them for uh, weeks and weeks on end, I, I generally did think that... Uh, IQPs were nothing much to write home about. But, you know, as always, there are practical difficulties for uh, for the black player, and uh, those shouldn't be underestimated. But just theoretically, I think that black's normally doing quite well. So queen e2 was played, um, bishop b7, and now knight e5. Yunoski playing it just, you know, aggressively, basically, using that e5 outpost and, um, well, you know, looking for pressure um, along the e-file. He's going to play rook e1, you know, have possible ideas of knight takes f7. And um, also, you know, the bishop uh, is pointing towards h7, so the queen might uh, try and come out to h5 sometime. So here, um, Rubinstein played the move queen b6, which looks a little bit um, aggressive. And, uh, you know, why wouldn't you just play bishop e7? It might well be that uh, Rubinstein spotted that knight takes b5 was possible here. And uh, the idea is a, b, queen takes b5. And then we're just going to pick up the bishop on b7. Funnily enough, the engines uh, uh, don't really see this as a problem and just want to play the move rook c8. Um, just leave the knight hanging there. Obviously, you're attacking... Uh, a c3 so the knight can't go back there and if you go knight a3 we just take take and go knight c3 here and uh, well we'll grab this bishop and well you know the extra double day pawn isn't worth anything at all it's just typical with the engines just uh, you know nothing is quite quite clear really is it but uh, queen b6 was um, was played by um, uh, Rubinstein and now um, bishop g5 from um, from uh, Yin, um, from Yanovsky there um, yeah, if queen takes d4, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I do wonder what Janowski was, was aiming to play. Maybe knight takes b5, although, you know, the queen can just retreat to b6. Uh, the engines want to play rook d1, queen b6, knight takes d5, um, bishop takes d5. And then this uh, rather interesting idea, and bishop e4 here. Um, obviously, if takes there, we take back with a queen, and we've got quite a few light squares to attack there. But takes, takes, rook c8. Um, queen e5, rook g8 was the uh, engine move, which, you know, ah, was just about equal, really. You know, white, uh, well, white's probably a little bit better. The, his king is a little bit safer, but there's nothing too amazing. But there's no real need to, to do anything, uh, you know, that uh, that courageous, really. The interesting thing, you know, I've, not, I've mentioned this before, that the engines want to play h6. Um, yeah, the way I was brought up, this was a big no-no. You don't weaken your king like that when uh, in an IQP when the opponent's bishop is pointing towards the king. But the engines are just yawning and saying, yeah, yeah, big deal. Who cares? <laughs> so uh, um, that would, uh, you know, that would probably be possible. Bishop d2 and the engines don't want to take on d4 or anything like that. Just bishop d6 and... Uh, you know, getting ready to eventually to uh, to castle. Um, but Ruby time played bishop d6, which was quite uh, natural. Rook e1. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're looking after queen takes d4. Obviously, we're teeing up for something like um, knight takes f7 there. Um, so um, uh, Rubinstein just played uh, rook d8. Just, um, yeah, just keeping this uh, this bishop uh, defended, making sure that, um, that uh, this sacrifice on f7 just doesn't get anywhere. Um, and now, yeah, um, Janowski had to had to do something. He came up with queen d2, which looks uh, a little bit funny, I have to admit, um, having played queen e2. But um, yeah, obviously he was um, well. He was kind of looking towards the um, uh, the king side. I think I would have preferred queen d3. Actually, that feels a little bit more natural. You know, sort of uh, hitting that uh, uh, h7 pawn and ready to swing over to g3 or to h3. If you swing over to h3, you know. Also got ideas of knight takes f7. That seems more natural. Queen d2 is a little bit strange. Um, but bishop b7 from uh, Rubinstein playing super, super safe there. Just making sure that uh, nothing is going to uh, to happen to his king. I mean, I guess he was worried that uh, if he goes castles that um, Yanovsky was going to take on d5. 
and then bishop f6 and uh, queen h6. That's uh, probably what uh, was causing him uh, concern. But just this very solid bishop e7 move. And yeah, you know, the, that's the thing about these IQP positions for black. Black is so solid, really, you know, just really so uh, so strong on um, on uh, in the center and all that. It can be very hard to shake the uh, the black position. But a3 played by, um, by Janowski, castles, and now queen d3. So um, just looking for some knight takes d5, some bishop takes, and uh, queen h7. Now this was uh, a first, you know, quite shocking uh, moment for me. Ah, oh, the engines, they really come up with some weird ones. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I was really thinking, well, basically there's one move, isn't there? I mean, there's, um, there's g6. Just to stop this... Um, this threat against h7 but the engines uh you know the main move is rook f e8 can you believe this and after knight d5 they want to take check okay that's your pawn <laughs> no worries and uh well you know obviously the engines attacking d4 and uh, and all of that and if queen h5 threatening queen f7 then they just want to take take and play f5 and uh claiming that this position is um is perfectly fine for black well in actual fact you know you're threatening stuff like rook d2 uh, so um yeah it is actually looking quite dangerous uh, the engines thought that this uh, draw by repetition was the uh, the best line but that's amazing rook f e8 you know um would i ever think of that i don't know i'd have to be um i'd have to be on fire really to uh, to think of that one i think uh, but g6 was played um and now um bishop a2 from um from Janowski and uh, to be honest Janowski's playing this very skillfully I mean these sort of uh, ideas you know you force g6 and then you redeploy the bishop to a2 um, these are really um, uh, yeah I mean these are modern ideas eh, about how you play the IQP and you know Janowski's just making it up as he goes along in 1914 here so yeah you know pretty impressive really so rook f8 was played by uh, Rubinstein. Uh, yeah, just a very, he's always had, you know, very nice, safe style. Keeping everything protected. e7 bishop is protected. e6 pawn also um, getting some extra protection there. And now queen h3 from um, from Janowski. Yeah, playing with the pieces. Uh, h4 um, was, uh, you know, an engine uh, suggestion here. And, uh, well, we're going to see it actually gets quite similar to, uh, to the game. This move, bishop d5 and then bishop e7 and queen e3. Um, I'll explain this move bishop d5 a little bit later but it's somewhat surprising but it is quite uh, quite an interesting idea you know that uh, yeah h4 is quite uh, quite yeah quite common in these positions uh, in modern positions I had a, uh, a game uh, 2014 Tromso Olympiad where I also did something with uh, with h4 that's uh, quite uh, quite well known but queen h3 very common idea as well and uh, you know it's a nice move aiming at f7 maybe getting these ideas and of course if you take on f7 and the king takes then well h7 might be uh, hanging so rubinstein you know keeps on playing for um for safety there um actually he could have taken on d4 but it's not very rubinstein-esque although to be honest i mean i do sort of wonder a little bit because um yeah i mean the ref well the refutation there's no refutation but white's best continuation is far from obvious it's not queen e6 when you uh, you just side sidestep out of the way it's um it's rook e6 here and uh, the idea is that this bishop on a2 is um uh, you know pinning the knight and we're going to get an awful lot of pressure here um so you go h5 in order to stop queen takes h7 and then we go rook d1 and uh, well this was uh, this was the idea you know why it's going to be able to take on f6 and take on d5 but we're going to get opposite colored bishops after King g7, knight d5, bishop d5. I think it was bishop f6 check. Then we take off, and then we take off, and then black takes off here, and, uh, you know, you just end up with some sort of equal opposite coloured bishop ending there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, if Rubinstein really uh, spotted this, and it's pretty good, really, because it wasn't obvious at all to me anyway. But, I mean, Rubinstein was also somebody who liked to uh, to play safe somehow. I mean, there was um, there's a game on my blog, in actual fact, that analysed between uh, the great uh, Henry Atkins very strong English amateur didn't play very much at all but when he did my goodness he was strong um against uh, Rubinstein and um uh, annotated on my blog and uh, yeah, again what you see is Rubinstein playing these sort of positions sort of hyper safe there were a number of uh, occasions where he could have gone for the win of the piece or whatever Atkins was playing just a little bit funnily uh, putting his pieces a little bit awkwardly but yeah you know Rubinstein was again playing it safe and uh, you know um I think that's just how he played these IQP positions probably trusting that uh, you know in the long term he'd neutralize all the initiative and uh, and just win on the weakness of this pawn but uh yeah 
sometimes uh, you know it's, it pays to uh, to take a chance. Um, but bishop e7, rook e7, and now this fine move, bishop d5. I like this move a lot. Bishop d5 and queen h4. So this move, bishop d5, it feels odd, doesn't it, to you know give up your only bishop and a light square bishop, which is you know pointing towards uh, the e6 and f7 squares, combining with a knight and the queen and the rook to just swap that off for a knight uh, and you know give away your light square bishop. That's well, controlling the squares around your um, your isolated pawn. Why is this a good move? Well, actually, I first came across this idea um, in a game Capablanca Alakin, nineteen thirteen, and um, yeah, this was the uh, the position. Ooh, just let your eyes uh, get used to that. Um, and um, here, uh, yeah, Capablanca did something quite interesting. He took on e seven, which I hadn't really expected, and then he played the move bishop e four, and. Uh, well, you know, Alakin went bishop b5 and uh, takes takes, and you know, this was just very very ugly for Black, and uh, Capablanca won this won this very very easily. But uh, you know, Black could have played the move knight f6 here, and uh, it was you know clearly um, Capablanca's idea to take on d5 like this. But you know, the idea of, um, of of swapping off the light square bishop for a knight like that is that you know, well, Black's got all these pawns, kingside pawns on light squares. And, well, the knight is one of the good pieces for defending the dark squares. So, you know, you drag a knight away from the, from the king side and then you're going to try and exploit the dark squares. For example, with moves like knight g4 and queen h6 or, you know, um, shoving this pawn all the way up to, uh, to h6 as well. So, um, yeah, that was Capablanca Alakin and Capablanca won quite a nice game. Um, and here we get, um, uh, we get um, uh, yeah, Janowski doing exactly the same and then playing the move queen h4. Just aiming for those uh, dark squares, and there's quite a few ideas uh, in this position. I mean, g4 is uh, is one idea, followed by rook e3 to h3. Actually, you know, and h7 is weak, and of course, you know, moves like knight g4 to h6, you know, all all possible as well. And of course, here we're attacking the rook on e7, and there's the rook on d8 behind it. So, very interesting idea. I thought it was a very fine positional idea from uh, Yanovsky, and um, yeah, um, here. Uh, Rubinstein played f6 and well you know Yanovsky played a move that the engines don't particularly approve of but yeah I thought it was a very natural move um the engines want something like knight g4 um but uh Yanovsky took on d5 which feels you know very very natural indeed you know and uh certainly wouldn't uh, complain about uh, playing a move like that but um funny enough the engines were looking at e takes d5 um in this position uh, the idea being to meet knight d3 with this move rook e4 when uh yeah we're just going to take back this d4 pawn and and equalize completely um um yeah knight d3 would be a great move otherwise otherwise you could just play the knight into c5 but that's a bit of a yeah i don't think you'd you wouldn't really expect a human player to take on d5 like that rook takes d5 uh, from um um from rubinstein is very obvious but now knight f3 and yeah you know it, it's uh, the engine thinks that there's nothing much wrong with black's position um but you know um, th there are some side difficulties. These, these major pieces are a little bit disconnected. We've also got ideas like um, like G4, for example. You know, so uh, really got to be careful about that. Now, of course, you know the point is the engines hold this together with tactics. So um, Queen B7 is uh, is the engine move. I think the idea was if G4, we do something like um, Knight F4, and uh, was it this one? This was what I thought anyway. Queen F6, Rook F5 takes and then queen takes f3 with uh with mate um because queen g5 allows knight h3 haha <laughs> but um so that's possible but rubinstein played king g7 and now queen e4 happened so um uh, g4 is um is his threat um now not 100 percent clear how much of a threat it is and again the engines you know keep it together uh with tactics uh queen b7 i think g4 f5 is the uh, is the idea um but rubinstein played king f7 Rook c1, grabbing the c-file, knight g7, and now g4. A good move there, stopping the knight coming to f5. And uh, yeah, I mean, the engines, you know, still consider this to be absolutely equal, no problem. But to be honest, I'd feel, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would feel a little bit uncomfortable with black here because I'm not 100% sure, you know, how I'm getting counterplay. And I'm getting a little bit worried about moves like g5, for example, you know, just uh, opening up my king. My king feels a little bit weak there as well. Um, now, what the engines want, they want knight e8, which is quite a nice idea. You know, you won't get the knight into uh, into d6 there. Yeah, chase the queen away from from e4. That feels like a, feels like a good move, to be honest. Um, Rubinstein played queen d6, which was a a little bit funny. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, the engines uh, got various ideas. B4 followed by uh, Rook C5 was, uh, was one engine idea. Um, another one was just to play H3 quietly uh, and then to play B4 and Rook C5. B4, Rook C5 was normal, but Rook C8 was um, uh, Janowski's move. And to be honest, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with it. Rook E8 and now Rook E C1. So we threatened to, to give a check on C7. So takes, takes was played. Knight e8, and now uh, Janowski went for it here uh, with a very sharp move. Uh, not the engine's choice, they want a, a slow build up with h4, but um, I have to say that g5 would be a, a very unpleasant move for uh, a human to face. Um, there's a couple of unpleasant points to it. Of course, I'm threatening gf and knight e5, but I, I've also got this possibility of queen h4 hitting the pawn on h7, so that's, that's rather nasty. Now, what do the engines want? The engines, um, they don't want uh, Rubinstein's move, which looks like the product of panic. Uh, they want queen d7. Um, and I didn't really understand why, because I thought, after all, can't you just go rook b8? Uh, because after queen c7, I've got rook takes c8, haven't I? And uh, after king e8, I've got queen e6. Well, that's not completely true, because <laughs> there's queen c1 check into mezzo. And after king g2, we go rook g5 check. Knight g5, queen g5, check, and then we're going to take on e8, and well, it's just going to be an equal position. You'll take on e6, and then, yeah, we'll just give perpetual check somehow. So that was really, you know, queen d7 is important, and then you can chase away the uh, um, the rook from the 8th rank, and, well, you're in better shape than uh, than you were, put it that way. It still feels a bit awkward to me, but, uh, yeah, the engines were, were holding this with, uh, with good endgame play. But Rubinstein played f takes g5, and uh, knight e5 check happened. Uh, it just goes to show how bad the position is that the engines just want to give away a piece with, uh, with king g7. So uh, the king e7 was played by uh, Rubinstein and now um, several ideas. Um, rook a8 was the engine um, uh, preference just to try and play something like rook a7 check. Uh, but queen f3 from, um, from um, uh, uh, Yanovsky was very strong as well. Just looking to play uh, queen f7 here. Knight f6 from uh, Rubinstein and now rook a8 and uh, we're threatening rook a7 check here. You know, this is really, really horrible. I mean, the, the, the point is as well, if you do something like queen c7, I go rook a7 and knight c6 check, you know, so it's really all falling apart. So, I mean, if, yeah, rook e5 was played, rook a7 check, knight d7 takes, takes, queen d1, forcing the exchange of queens through the pressure on there, queen d6 takes, rook a6. And yeah... Could you believe it if I told you that uh, Janowski was going to lose this position? Incredible, simply incredible. And yet, you know, um, it doesn't take much. It just takes, it takes one, yeah, careless move, basically. And uh, then the position is just drawn. And then it takes, uh, you know, I think a long period of loathing and disgust, which leads to the eventual uh, uh, draw and the disaster. Um, I mean, the, the thing is here, of course, is that white should just play the move b3 and a4 quickly, get that pass pawn rolling, and then, you know, whilst the king and the knight are dealing with it, get at the, get at the kingside pawns. Um, that's what has to happen, uh, basically, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, black can do, can do all sorts of things. I mean, this king and the knight are quite active, and you've got checks, and you can come back here, and, you know, you can do stuff. It's not, uh, you know, 100%, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, eyes closed win, but still, it's very, very close. What Yanoski did was, um, like all good schoolboys are taught, he, uh, you know, he brought his king into the centre, and again, you know, something with b3 and uh, an a4, that's what we really want. But he played this rather odd move, rook a8, knight e5. Now he played rook a6 check. King went back to d7. And rook b6, that's that's fine. You know, just hitting that pawn on uh, on, on b5 there. But now knight f3 from um, from <laughs> Rubinstein. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of little problems. Uh, actually, uh, uh, king c7 is, uh, is a rather annoying threat because uh, after rook b5, there's knight d4 check. And if rook e6, there's knight d4 check as well. I mean, bringing the king into the centre has not been a good idea, simply. You know, it, it's just opened the, uh, the, the you know, white uh, up to all sorts of, uh, to checks and forks. And actually, the engines just either want to play king f1, which seems a bit extreme, or play king e3, you know. And after knight h2, rook b5, knight f3, we go a4, and that's just trivial. You know, that's just going to be easily winning. So that would have been really easy, but ah, uh, Janowski played uh, h3, and, um, um, and now after this move, h3, 
uh, the engines are saying 0 0.00 and they don't change that until Yanofsky finally blunders. So, yeah. The point is, I, I guess that Yanofsky was expecting knight g1, um, but actually knight d4 check is possible because uh, if you go king d3, I take on there and you've placed your rook so badly that, uh, yeah, there's no stopping the queen. So he went king f1 and now g takes h3 and, uh, well, why it's just basically given the pawn away and... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, even getting in b3 is quite uh, is quite tricky now because the knight's covering everything. Um, so, yeah, Yanofsky played rook b7 check and rook g7 and now knight f3. And, uh, yeah, I get the feeling probably he was just, you know, probably to his horror, he was just realising things at the last moment. Rook g6 allows h2 and knight h4. You've got to give it to Rubinstein. Now he's uh, fighting like an absolute lunatic here. So rook f7 was played, knight d2 check, king g1, you know, we've gone all the way back, all the way here, g5. Rook h7 was played, and now knight f3 check, the king goes in the corner, and h4. And well, what a lot of progress black has made, and uh, well, I mean, g5 to g4 to g3 is starting to look like a, like a plan, really, isn't it? So um, rook f7 was played. Um, knight e5, rook g7, knight f3, and now um, uh, b3 was played. So finally we're playing this plan with a4. But it's not really, you know, that good a plan really. And, uh, well, black's pawns are ready to roll here. Um, so king c5 was played, just uh, stopping the pawn from rolling. And, you know, black's idea really is to just try and play e4 to e3 and, uh, you know, just get these pawns rolling here. So, yeah, white's well, got to be really careful with his rook. Um, so... Yeah, what would you recommend for uh, for white? Well, I mean, actually, one of the things that um, that the engines was recommending was a5, king b5, rook b7 check, king takes, and then rook b4. So um, just cutting off the king, and if king b4, it's it's stalemate. So um, yeah, that's a little bit extreme, really. I'm not really sure about that one, really. Um, but, um, you know, what you could also do is, uh, of course, is just go rook b5 check and uh, just uh, check, 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 check the king until um, it's stalemate. So that would have been quite a, quite a fun way to go. But, uh, well, rook f7, we're still not losing, but we're just giving white all sorts of, black rather, all sorts of moves. So we went a5 and we got g4. Uh, yeah, obviously g3 and g2 is, uh, is coming in. And now this is the moment where, last moment that Yanofsky had to save this position. He needs to go rook d7 check and then go rook g7. Um, and the point is the king's far away, so, you know, we are going to be able to save this position. And after takes and g3, we go a6, you go g2, and, uh, well, you can imagine this is going to be, um, uh, this is going to be a, a, a draw. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's uh, 91 check, king h3, king b6, and, yeah, all that happens. So that was the last moment he had to chase the black king away, but, uh, yeah... Uh, Yanofsky unfortunately played rook g7 and after g3 takes and e3 he resigned why is that well um, the problem is that when you check the king now the king comes to e4 and if you go rook e7 we go knight e5 and you're not going to be able to stop e2 to e1 you're just too many tempi down you spent so long getting that a pawn going that uh, yeah it's just finished I mean, a real heartbreaker. You could just not imagine that um, that White could, yeah, that White could um, lose this position, let alone uh, draw it. You know, I mean, that also seems uh, completely impossible. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, just one careless move, this uh, H3, um, just uh, losing a pawn, um, the game was drawn, and then yeah, Yanofsky was probably so disheartened he threw the game away as well. And uh, yeah, you know, and these were the sort of games that sort of contributed to the uh, the impression of Yanofsky as uh, you know as not a serious player really. And uh, you know, I, I mean, you understand that this is this is really bad, but uh, but still, you know, it's uh, a bit unfair when you consider how many other wonderful games he's played and wonderful things he's done. You know, um, it's also you know the waning of a of a player's strength. Um, uh, I think at New York 1924, the other players were saying, well, you know, for the first three hours of the game, Yanofsky was uh, one of the best players in the world, but he, you know, he lost his stamina and, and then things started to go wrong after uh, for him in the games, you know. But 
yeah, it's just uh, yeah, you know, chess is cruel. It's uh, it's a competitive game, so no mercy for uh, you know for anyone as they get older somehow. But uh, yeah, it's a bit shame, a bit of a shame that uh, you know Fionovsky and also for Bogdanov, their reputations were sort of dictated by um, yeah by by some of by by a, a poor result, but against a supreme player of their of their day, really. It uh, it doesn't really seem fair. But there we are. I hope you enjoyed that all the same. I thought it was a very interesting IQP and uh, some, yeah, particularly I like, very much like this uh, bishop d5 idea. Definitely remember that in uh, in your own games. And, uh, you know, just playing normally afterwards, just trying to exploit the weak dark squares caused by this pawn structure. It's quite instructive. And uh, if you like that, why not give a like, subscribe to the channel, take a look at my new book, Re-Engineering the Chess Classics. Really uh, is an excellent game. And if enough people buy it, then I've got plenty more games that you could show in uh, in a sequel. So... Go for it. You know what you know. It makes sense. But otherwise, thanks very much for uh, for yeah having a look at this video, being part of the channel, and hope to see you at the next ones. Thanks for watching.